So I'll be going over some of my uh, research here at NUS on early bilingualism. Um, and then after that, I'll be talking a bit about some recent findings and some future directions of what grants that I have, or projects that I have um, launching right now, to talk a bit about where my research is going. But essentially, my research is focused on language acquisition and on early language acquisition from zero to three, so infant language development, and specifically on bilingualism. Okay. Uh, so there's sort of a basic research question here and then more applied questions. I think the basic questions that, uh, that um, drive my research are how does bilingualism modify child development? And we know that bilingualism exerts very early and profound influence on the developing mind and the developing brain in many spheres of um, knowledge or many spheres of cognition. So we see, for example, newborn babies who are bilingually exposed respond to language differently compared to newborn babies who are monolingually exposed in the last trimester of pregnancy. So we see very early effects of language exposure um, on perception. Um, we also see, I think this is probably the most widely studied area of uh, bilingual consequences on the mind and brain, we see cognitive effects. So effects specifically on uh, attentional switching, um, perspective taking, inhibition, um, executive control in bilingual children and adults. Um, and we're starting to see effects of bilingualism on social development. So this is something that I'm interested in going forward, whether bilingualism opens up your perception in a way that makes you respond differently to people from different racial groups or different cultural groups. Uh, so does it open up your cultural frame of reference um, as much as it opens up your language? Um, so this is relevant, it's very relevant to Singapore, but it's also very relevant globally because more children around the world, even in traditionally monolingual societies like the UK or the United States, are being raised uh, in bilingual environments. So it's, it's an important question. Um, at the same time, most of developmental research has focused on monolingual children. Um, so we have the potential to expand the narrative that we have on early child development by looking at uh, bilingual children. Uh, so why zero to three? It's not the easiest population to work with. Um, so there's lots of behavioral and temperamental issues that would make, uh, that would maybe deter researchers from going into this age group. But it's a very, very important age group developmentally to look at language. Um, so zero to three is where we really see profound effects of exposure, of social and linguistic experience. This is widely documented in the US, um, specifically in research looking at the word gap. Uh, which shows us that children before they even go into preschool as early as 18 months show, uh, uh, seem to be worse off in word recognition or language acquisition if they come, for example, from low socioeconomic uh, families. Um, so they're less well prepared for the demands of even preschool um, based on their family situation. So this is really a time when opportunity leaves its imprint. It really leaves a footprint on the child's development and unfortunately that has cascading effects um, for a child's, a child's later learning potential and opportunities. Um, so this is the time that I think we really need to target identification and intervention uh, for children who are at risk, even if they're at risk for uh, things that we believe to be unchangeable, like their family uh, socioeconomic status or uh, education variables. Um, so how do we compensate for risk factors? Um, and these are some of the questions that guide uh, basic research in language development and are also relevant to bilingualism because we don't really know what the interaction is between bilingualism and other demographics. So does bilingualism compensate for some of the effects um, that introduce risk or does bilingualism exacerbate um, risk? We don't know what the answers are to these basic questions in bilingualism. But there's also applied relevance of bilingualism research. So if you speak to a bilingual a parent raising bilingual children, there's a lot of anxiety typically around uh, children becoming bilingual. So how do I raise a bilingual child? What should I be looking for? How should I monitor progress? Am I, my child has a language delay, is that because he or she is bilingual? We don't have good bilingual norms right now, uh, so we don't even have a clear answer to these very fundamental questions to address quite widespread parental concerns. Um, we also have to think about education. So if we take, for example, a bilingual five-year-old who is not making progress in early reading development, do we benchmark that child against their monolingual peer? How do we set expectations? How do we set thresholds 
and how do we set um, markers for clinical risk? So how do we know how bilingualism enters into the equation when we're monitoring child's, uh, children's basic development? Um, so this is a question that I think is largely unanswered in education. How do we benchmark bilingual and monolingual children? Uh, do we hold bilingual children to the same standards of single language proficiency, or do we uh, set aside a separate uh, set of criteria? So there are different ways of looking at how bilingualism affects language development, and I'll talk first about language development and then a bit about social development. Um, and the traditional way has been to count up the number of words that bilingual children know versus monolingual children know. And I would say that that research has led to has actually fueled concerns about bilingualism because what we see from that is that bilingual children typically show lower single language vocabulary scores. So a child learning English and Mandarin would typically show uh, lower single language <coughs> vocabulary in English compared to a child only learning English. And you can imagine as a parent that uh, makes you that can make you anxious about whether your child has a language delay because they're not keeping up with a child next door who's speaking. Um, uh, much more productively. Um, and we know from some of the research um, in my lab that that's no different in Singapore. Uh, bilingual children show uh, slower growth in the infant years um, in English compared to monolingual children. Um, but I'd like to, I think, ex uh, talk about the value of going beyond that and to look at um, the process of word learning, the process of language development. So when, when children pick up words on the fly in a conversational setting, or in a social setting, is that process fundamentally different in bilingual children? Um, and do bilingual children use the same kinds of cues uh, compared to monolingual children? Or are they looking for more cues because they have more ambiguity and more uncertainty in their environment? Uh, so my research has mostly looked at eye movement responses uh, using eye trackers because I work with very young children who don't readily volunteer um, a response. Uh, so the advantage of eye tracking research is that you can look at involuntary responses to speech and language and you can make inferences from that, those responses about what children understand and what they know. Um, so my research is really in word finding, word learning and word recognition and I'll talk about the second two um, directions today. Uh, and my methods are all, all, all reliant on children showing responses to visual stimuli um, uh, when they're listening to stimuli, partly because or mainly because Listening is not observable. You can't tell if someone's listening to you or not, but you can tell if they're looking at something. Um, so fundamentally, I'm interested in whether the language development in bilingual children is the same or different um, in word learning, word recognition. And I have focused mostly on English and Mandarin because that's the population uh, that has volunteered to come into my lab. But I'm ex interested in extending that. I think it's very important to extend that to other bilingual populations. Having said that, English and Mandarin um, provide an interesting comparison because they're very different languages. Um, and a lot of my research is focused on the tones of Mandarin. Uh, so tone, I think, is particularly interesting because t the ups and downs of the pitch of people's voice is there in English and Mandarin, but it conflicts. So it has a lexical function in English, sorry, in Mandarin, and a non-lexical function in English. Okay, so I'll talk initially about whether monolingual and bilingual babies learn words with equal ability um, in each of their languages. And this is work done with Felicia Poe and Charlie Poe. Um, so I'll present a study looking at one-year-old bilingual babies and monolingual babies. Um, and one-year-olds are interesting because they're just beginning to show us that they know words, but they've actually known words for several months uh, prior to that. Uh, so we tested English monolinguals, Mandarin monolinguals, and English Mandarin bilinguals in Singapore. And uh, we used a task that I'll go through in a minute, but it's called a switch task. And it measures word learning by eye tracking in babies. Uh, so I'll play a video of the task, that may make it clearer. Um, Bye. 
Ba. Here is the Ba. Do you see the Ba? Ba. Look, it's the Ba. Here is the Ba. So this is a very widely used paradigm, uh, and this is a shorter version of, version of it. Of course, it must go through something much longer. Uh, to look at how quickly children pick up word meaning associations on the on the fly. So in the in an uh, it's not an interaction, but uh, upon being exposed to words and meanings. So what they learn in a longer habituation phase is this object is called a ba, and it's produced in Mandarin tone three. Um, and then they hear, they see three test trials, and we monitor the looking time for each test trial. So one is just the same thing that they saw uh, in exposure, and then if we look at the looking times of these test trials, we think they'll be relatively low, because they just heard this um, several times. The second is a switch trial, where they change um, from bar in tone 3 to bar in tone 2. So the, the tone changes in Mandarin. And the third is a switch trial where they go from bar in tone 3 to bar in tone 1. So what's the significance of these switches? If you're listening in English, as in the first session, these tone changes shouldn't matter, right? So it's still a bar, it's just a bar in a different pitch pattern. If you're listening in Mandarin, you have to be on high alert for these pitch changes because they actually determine the meaning of a word. So in Mandarin, this would technically be uh, mislabeling. It wouldn't be a correct label for that object. Uh, so we looked at three groups, uh, monolinguals, um, English monolingual Mandarin, uh, and bilingual English Mandarin. And the bilingual group was tested in both languages. The monolingual groups were tested in their respective native languages. Um, so what we expected was that monolingual Mandarin babies would respond to these tone changes, monolingual English babies would not, and we didn't know what bilingual babies would do. Um, so if we look at the monolingual participants, none of these results were significant. So neither monolingual group was responsive to the tone changes. And they're only 12 months of age, so it's possible that babies are too young at this point to integrate tone changes uh, into the meanings of newly learned words. But if we look at bilingual babies, they showed an interesting and different pattern. So they were non-responsive to tone changes in English, just like their English monolingual peers, but they were responsive to tone changes in Mandarin. So they are showing um, a lead in their perception and responsiveness to Mandarin tones compared to monolingual babies, even compared to monolingual Mandarin babies. So these bilingual babies are hearing Mandarin on a part-time basis. Their monolingual Mandarin peers are hearing it full-time. So it's surprising uh, in the sense that bilingual babies would show precocity in how they respond to Mandarin tones. So then we went on to look at whether this is just Mandarin tones and whether bilingual babies show uh, a lead in how, um, in how they perceive other kinds of sound change. But before we go on to that, we followed up the Mandarin monolingual group at 18 months and they showed a similar responsiveness at 18 months uh, to tones in Mandarin. So bilingual babies were showing about a six month lead um, compared to monolingual peers. We then looked at the same uh, phenomenon using the same task with vowel changes that were relevant in both languages. So we looked at a change, in this case, from min to mun. Um, and this is a vowel change that shows up in English and in Mandarin. So it's um, lexical in both languages. Um, and we found that monolingual Mandarin babies at 18 months were not responsive to this change. Uh, monolingual English babies were not responsive, but bilingual English Mandarin babies uh, were responsive. So we see, again, bilingual uh, precocity in responses to sound changes that in this case were re relevant to both languages. Then we wanted to go very far away and we took really weird sounds. So we took click sounds from African languages. So there are languages that use sounds like as a phoneme, as a consonant. 
And these are sounds that no parent here reported their child having been exposed to. Uh, we wanted to see if bilingual babies show an advantage in sounds that are so far away from their experience and so far away from their native language typologically that they could never have had any reason to have a language ex uh, uh, experience driven um, uh, advantage. And with these click sounds uh, from an African language, we found again that bilingual babies responded to this click change in a word learning task and monolingual babies did not. Um, so from this we conclude that the process of word learning is different in bilingual babies compared to monolingual babies. And specifically, bilingualism may confer upon young babies a very keen sensitivity to sound change. And this may be a sensitivity that they really need to pick up to sound systems. Um, so they seem to show advantages in learning new and unfamiliar languages. And now we're looking to see, well, we follow the children up, to, to even when they're adults, do they show an advantage in picking up new linguistic information? And I want to mention briefly that this is specific to language. We did, I haven't presented the results, but we did the same studies where we labeled one object with a hand clap and one with a finger snap. And neither group were responsive to those uh, changes. So it seems to be specific to the sounds of uh, languages. Um, so now I want to move on to whether these advantages show up or whether there are disadvantages once you're processing words in your native language. Uh, so if you go older, if you test infants when they're older, when they're two or three years old, they already have hundreds of words. So you want to look at whether bilingual babies versus monolingual babies uh, respond to sound changes when they already know words in different ways. Now this is work done with Liang Hui Wang and Dilu Uh So we tested monolingual Mandarin toddlers and bilingual English Mandarin uh, toddlers at 24 months on a similar paradigm, except this paradigm measures responsiveness to words you already know. So to sound changes for words like cat and ball and boy, things that are already in the child's uh, lexicon. Um, I'll just briefly talk about the paradigm, but basically it's a naming paradigm where the child sees, again it's looking time and eye tracking, sees two objects, um, then they just, we measure their fixation with these objects, and then they hear look at the flower. And we measure looking time when they, or in the look at phase versus the flower phase. And uh, when, uh, if they're responsive, uh, they recognize the word, then their looking time goes up when they hear the word flower relative to before they heard the word flower. Uh, and then we have some trials that are mispronunciation trials. So we'll have, look at the flower. Uh, do they false alarm and go over to the flower, or do they recognize this is a mispronunciation and demonstrate no preferential looking? Um, and then we have vowel changes and tone changes. And we wanted to see whether bilingual and monolingual babies are equally good at recognizing words they know in Mandarin, and whether they're equally good at inhibiting their response to mispronunciation, so not looking over at the flower when it's labeled as a flower. Um, in the interest of time, I'll probably skip this video, um, but it's essentially an eye tracking paradigm where we measure, we look at eye gaze uh, to these two objects while the child is in the experiment. Um, so our results show that when words are correctly pronounced, both bilingual and monolingual children or toddlers um, correctly recognize the word. They very quickly go over to flower, and they go over to flower with equal accuracy and equal efficiency. Uh, when they hear the word mispronounced by a vowel, so if it's a bowl and it's pronounced as a bill, neither group uh, responds to that. So both, group are, both groups are aware of mispronunciation effects due to vowels, similar for consonants, similar for tones. So if we look at word recognition and word learning, we see similarities in word recognition, so similarities in the phonological precision with which bilingual babies represent sound changes once they know the word. But when they're learning the word, we see a more keen sensitivity to sound changes in bilingual babies. And this may be what bilingual babies need to really navigate the complexity of a bilingual environment. Um, so going forward, we're looking at whether bilingual babies respond to accented input in different ways. So if you're very sensitive to sound change, that can really trip you up if somebody comes at you speaking English with a different accent. So do you normalize for that or do you uh, get thrown off by that? Um, Charlene, who a PhD student, is looking at language mixing, which is a very common part of the Singapore uh, bilingual landscape. 
Um, and what we're finding preliminarily is that when babies are learning words, mixing languages is not good for teaching them words within a sentence. When babies already know words, then mixing languages is something that is fine. Um, and then I just briefly want to talk about whether this flexibility that we see in language extends to social development. Uh, so do bilingual babies retain greater flexibility in how they see other people? And do they maintain the kinds of social biases, specifically racial biases, that we see in monolingual uh, infants? Um, so I'll talk a bit about this first study, which is a study where we brought in seven to eight month old bilingual, half bilingual, half monolingual infants. And this is a paradigm that we used that was based on a study done uh, by Paul Bloom and Kylie Hamlin, looking at whether what babies care, whether you're a good person or a bad person, and do they want good things to happen to you if you're good, and do they want bad things to happen to you if you're bad. And what they found was that babies around eight months of age like nice people, they dislike not nice people, and they like people that help good people, and they dislike people that help bad people. They like people that punish bad people, and they dislike people that help bad people. So at eight months, they have a pretty complex social schema that governs their responses to, to newly exposed characters. Um, so I won't play the whole video because it's quite long, but here's a video of how we implemented this paradigm in our lab. So we basically put on a little pantomime for every baby um, and measure their looking time to these puppets. Um, and what happens in the full paradigm is that there's a good puppet and a bad puppet. The good puppet's nice, helps the other person to distribute resources equally, which in this case is two blocks. And then after that, for some babies, the bad puppet is punished and the good puppet is rewarded. For some babies, it's the opposite. Um, and babies like people who punish the bad puppet and reward the good puppet. But then, Sometimes good people turn bad, and bad people turn out to be good. So then we added onto the study by reversing the roles, uh, where the bad puppet suddenly becomes really nice, and the good puppet suddenly becomes naughty. Um, so do babies update their impressions based on this new information? And do bilingual babies selectively update more readily than monolingual babies? I'll just play a little bit of the video to show you. So you see um, that the puppet takes away the blocks from the, the good guy, so there's clearly a good guy and a bad guy, and then later on somebody comes in to help the good guy and gives him a ball that's gone astray, uh, and people like the, the puppet that goes and helps the good guy. What we found in our results is that all babies, bilingual and monolingual, like the helpful puppet over the unhelpful puppet. And all babies like for unhelpful puppets to be punished, to have stuff taken away from them um, over helpful puppets. But when the roles change, when the good puppet becomes bad and the bad puppet becomes good, then monolingual babies didn't care. They retained their original judgment. If they liked the good puppet in phase one, they still liked the good puppet. Bilingual babies didn't demonstrate reversal, but they demonstrated ambivalence. So they were different in, um, or they, they, they were, they didn't show any puppet preference when their roles changed. Um, so we looked at a similar phenomenon in older children, specifically at racial biases. Again, this is a paradigm that was not developed by us. It was developed by Kang Lee and Paul Quinn um, and Nai, Nai Si Xiao. And this is a study where we looked at racial sensitivities uh, in bilinguals versus monolingual babies. So the basic paradigm is up here, where you see all of the babies were Chinese raised for this study. We had to race match them. And half were bilingually exposed and half were monolingually exposed. And they go through a series of training trials. Um, so if you look at the top left quadrant, um, what they hear in every trial is the person saying, hey baby, look over here. And then they look over in the direction. And that's rewarded because then they see an Elmo dancing or Big Bird dancing. Um, but in some trials, the Chinese race person says, hey baby, look over here. And then Elmo shows up on the other side. So the person is proving themselves to be unreliable and they're proving themselves to be untrustworthy. And then they see the same thing with, in this case, an Indian race person, where they say, hey baby, look over here. And Elmo shows up. 
the same person says, hey, maybe look over there, and then the reinforcement's on the other side. And what uh, Kangi and others, his collaborators, have found was that very early on, um, as early as six or seven months of age, babies lose trust if you're a different race and you're unreliable. But if you're untrustworthy and you're the same race as them, they keep trusting you. So they show what's called selective trust, or the beginnings of uh, an early racial bias. Um, so we looked to see whether bilingual babies and monolingual babies showed these biases in similar measure. What we found was that all babies believed reliable other people. So they didn't believe these were Chinese race babies. They believed the Indian race person as much as they believed the Chinese race person when they were both reliable. It's when they were unreliable that monolingual babies continued to be replicated uh, Kangli's finding, continue to believe unreliable others if they were Chinese. So they continued to trust their own race um, community members. Bilingual babies lost trust in unreliable others, whether they were the same race or whether they were different races. So we're looking to expand this area of research to see what are the um, drivers of this effect? So what is it about bilingualism that, makes, that may open up your sense of um, social categories and uh, may make you more judicious in how you respond to people based on their behavior, based on your experience with them? Okay, so I see I have uh, one more minute, so I'll just quickly summarize uh, and then go to some future directions. So um, we see that bilingual babies may learn and approach their environment in fundamentally different ways. Bilingualism may uh, sculpt and scaffold the developing mind in unique but important ways, um, and this may lead to greater cognitive flexibility, but also flexibility in language and social perception. Um, so I'm very interested in what are the consequences of this downstream for future development. Um, so going forward, I have two streams of research, or three rather, but I'll just talk about the first two because um, they're sort of getting going right now. So I have a tier two grant starting and like now, uh, this month, We're looking at whether uh, language perception, so the title of the grant is Language, Social and Cognitive Development, looking at whether language perception of bilingual babies is similar to monolingual babies, looking specifically at the input patterns that seem to uh, help and support bilingual language processing. I'm also interested in expanding uh, this research on race to look at whether race relations develop differently in bilinguals versus monolingual babies. And then it has an intervention component to look at what you can do to actually help babies to become bilingual. And specifically, if you stimulate cognitive mechanisms implicated in bilingualism, does that stimulate the uptake of language? Um, the Center for po uh, Family and Population Research has a large SSRC grant and there's a bilingualism uh, team on that. Uh, and so in that team, we're looking at population-based approaches, uh, looking at the beginnings of citizenship, so altruism, social behaviors, um, responses to others, assimilation of new cultural routines, is that different for bilinguals versus monolingual babies? Um, the nice thing about this grant is that it's a population-based grant, so we have the chance to look at other races and other bilingual groups and diversify um, our sampling. Uh, and then together with Hui Shan Chen, who's here from Yale and US, I'm interested in looking at, um, in particular, SES effects in Singapore on uh, single and dual language uptake. So what are the relationships between um, income in Singapore or maternal paternal education and language uptake? And specifically, is there a word gap in Singapore um, that disadvantages particular groups and how does that interact with bilingualism? Uh, so Hui Shan is a parenting attachment researcher and I'm obviously coming at it from language. So we're looking to see how the child's sort of ecosystem uh, sets them up well or in a disadvantaged way for later development. I'd just like to acknowledge all of the people uh, in my lab and collaborators who've contributed to this research. Thank you. All right, we're now going to go up our Q&A session. Thank you. characteristics yeah. and, and so but in say other countries people 
people could speak different languages but look alike. So yeah. you couldn't tell somebody who spoke Norwegian and English at home whether he was had a racial bias against. Whether, in other words, how have, how do you distinguish or can you distinguish between racial features, you know, face and stuff like that, and and language? Yeah, I think that's a very important question. So those things are confounded um, here. So people who speak Chinese tend to be a particular race. And, um, so I, I think that's one of that's one of the directions that we'll go in. But the other direction I'm interested in looking at is things like accent, things that cue the language that you're going to use. Um, so it can't just be that this this gives us insight into the fact that children use just the look of your face to determine whether you're reliable or not. But if you are if you're the Indian race person, but you speak Chinese, does that make you a member of that person's community? And does it override your racial bias? So this is a very first view look at, it, uh, at the phenomenon because it's just, they're just being static on a, a moving image of somebody's face. Or if you speak the same language but you speak with a different accent, does that trump a tr Trump um, uh, language group? So I can think of race, um, accent, and face as three cues that might make you a member of a community or might exclude you from that community, and how those things rank and their influences. Yeah. Um, I'd be interested to know whether you would predict the same effect or different effects or stronger effects if they're face types that are less familiar to the participants in the study. So by, by selecting an Indian face, that's um, uh, a community face type that's quite common in Singapore. Yeah. Not as common as uh, Chinese facial characteristics, but it's not... Um, quite as different as it could be. So it's it's not uh, an African black yeah, person, yeah. for example. So I wonder how you think the role of facial familiarity with certain types might relate to this in-group, out-group uh, perception. Yeah, that's an important question. So, I mean, there are statistical differences in the likelihood yeah. of you seeing a Chinese face versus an Indian face versus an African face. Yeah. Um, so Versus I, a Western face. Versus a Western face, right? Yeah, um, and then it's possible that you have preconceptions about those faces that are independent of the statistics, right? So I can yeah. imagine a situation where your teacher is a certain race, and you follow that person's direction regardless of what they do, um, or you're in a community that's perhaps different from your race, um, and if you're educating that community, you have a different relationship with adults in that community. Um, so. I would predict something a bit more complex than a simple statistical account. I would predict that early on, races have social capital and that babies are probably tuned into that. Um, so it predicts probably an interaction. Baby, do you have some, am I misremembering, or do you have some data on, that you presented on asymmetries between Chinese face, responses to Chinese faces and Indian faces? Oh, okay. Okay, I thought somebody had done some research showing a directional asymmetry where Indian children were uh, more, showed less racial bias towards Chinese faces, but Chinese children. Okay, yeah, preschool. Okay, yeah, with preschool children. Chinese children showed more racial biases towards Indian faces. So they could also be directional asymmetries. So what percentage of. Uh Chinese in, in Singapore are fully bilingual. Oh, uh, of children or adults? Pardon? Of children or of adults? Of, of children, or is this current generation? Growing up know. generation? Um, it's very hard to find. Oh, do you know? If they go to school, they have to by primary one. Yeah. yeah. Everyone is by primary one. By primary one, yeah, but I don't know about when, you're, when you could be in private care, so when you're an infant. Right. Um, but if you go to yeah, well, every school is basically. But 99% of kids have an equal school. So you would need to have exposure by then. Right, so it's tricky in Singapore because we actually have to do quite detailed language exposure questionnaires and set really hard cutoffs because almost everybody has some multilingual exposure and some, some children have third language, heritage language exposure from grandparents. Um, so we have a cutoff that's established as 30 no more than 30%, uh, sorry, no less than 30% to second language, no more than 10% to a third language. Um, but we, there are a lot of children 
when you say how many children are bilingual, that's not an easy question to answer because I would suspect that almost everybody is multilingually exposed, but not everybody has a working functional knowledge of two languages or has balanced exposure. Bilingual has better executive function, or bilingualism has developed by the executive function in general, and this case is just reflection. Yes. In the research on executive function, bilingual children. Yeah, so going forward in this uh, tier two grant, we're looking at the link between executive functions, inhibitory control, perspective taking, and some of these effects. So, for example, I wouldn't be surprised if the racial bias or selective trust result had something to do with perspective taking advantages. But we don't have those data, so we're looking at expanding the task inventory to include collateral costs that we can measure. Great experiments. Um, as you know, we both have kids in the bilingual program. And we don't both have kids in the bilingual. You have kids in the bilingual. Oh, I thought you were no, 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 oh, no. Oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, when I was looking at the data from the mispronunciation, yeah. it was making me think of just some anecdotal things at, at home. And I was wondering if you expect when the kids become toddlers or preschoolers, if maybe different with bilinguals and perhaps also having an influence on theory of mind, yeah. if you might expect a very different pattern of results. So perhaps the bilingual children being more tolerant of mispronunciations because of different accented people trying to speak their language, etc. Yeah, so it's a fine balance, right, being sensitive to sound change. Because on the one hand, you, it's good to be sensitive to sound change. On the other hand, if, if somebody walks in with an accent, you have to suddenly collapse across sound change to understand them. Uh, so looking, that's one of the reasons, or that's the main reason I want to look at accented input, because um, what we see is that bilingual children have an acute sensitivity to sound change, but at some point that can, that can trip you up if you're, you're listening to accented speakers, or if somebody ch changes in a context-driven way the pronunciation of a word. Um, so, some people say butter, some people say butter, right? That's a different phoneme. Right. Uh, so can bilinguals collapse across that phoneme even though they're sensitive to sound change? And, and do you also think that a children's understanding of another person's language background themselves may also influence? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So yeah, speaking of the uh, of bilingual education, I think one very important question is, does it matter who's giving each source of input? And this is also a question that's very relevant to families. So parents often say, that I don't really speak Mandarin. Should I be opening my mouth at all at home, or should I be, get, uh, you know, putting this in the hands of a native speaker? Uh, generally speaking, I think research from the States and Canada show us that children need native language input, and that includes accent um, uh, as the primary source of input. Does that answer? Yeah. Um, can, can I follow just on the back of that, because it's quite closely related. Um, we're currently developing a survey that is specifically designed to get at what people believe about what they should or shouldn't do in their homes. So we may be able to contribute some interesting data on, on this point of how people make their decisions So What people believe uh, in an evidence-based way or in their own intuitive way? It's a, a survey of opinions. Okay, that will be very interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so who speak, who, what beliefs do they have about what's good for babies at different ages? Uh, how do they make their decisions about what languages they intend to speak with their babies? Yeah. Um, who did they, what sources of information did they seek? Did, were they reading mommy blogs? Were they reading magazines? Were they reading government websites? Yeah. Or were they asking their mother in law? That's very interesting, you know? yeah. So the whole spectrum of where is the information coming from? What do people think is good? What do they plan to do? Uh, and, and how do they think it's going to work? And, and what do they really do? So mixing is a classic example uh, where uh, Charlene Fu is looking at language mixing and she has a mixing questionnaire. And almost everyone comes in and says, mixing is bad. I would never mix. It's terrible. And then they proceed to play with their child and they mix yeah, languages. Yeah. So whether it's, uh, so there's clearly a social stigma attached to language mixing, but that's not overlapping with what parents are actually doing uh, in real life. So yeah. yeah, that'll be very interesting. Yeah. So. Uh, do you take intelligence into account in your studies for the individuals? We have intelligence sort of intelligence testing for babies, so we do the baby scales for every baby. 
Um, and we've never found relationships between the Bailey scores and any of our language dependent variables. Uh, so we've always looked at that, but we've never found, uh, the only thing that we've found a relationship with, with the Baileys, is that when they're in these looking time paradigms, babies with higher Bailey scores habituate more quickly. So they get, um, and that's been long demonstrated in the infant literature, they, they get through information more rapidly. Question, in relation to intelligence, is the sample that you, that you look at the women coming into the laboratory with their children, are they biased towards higher intelligence, higher socioeconomic, or do you? They're, they're definitely higher socioeconomic status, so, so they're volunteers. So there would be less variance in intelligence. Yes, yeah. So they actually look, they don't, uh, I guess by now we probably test four or 5,000 babies, and they don't assume a normal distribution. They're definitely at the high end of uh, there's definitely a skew, yeah. So that's one of the reasons why we would like to go into uh, lower income neighborhoods to sort of level out the, um, the, our sampling practices. But uh, we have to work out logistical issues. Sorry, um, sorry, I think the interest of time will close the Q&A session. Uh, if you'd like to speak with Professor Singh, you can speak to her during lunch. Um, so now I'll, I'll so please join me in thanking Professor Singh.